This presentation is part two of 2 Nephi 11 through 19. And in this part two, we will consider chapters 15 through 19. So let's begin with 2 Nephi chapter 15, which is comparable to Isaiah 5. 2 Nephi 15, the phrase, A Song of the Lord's Vineyard. The terrible darkness and apostasy described in 2 Nephi 15, 1-25 will abound prior to the destruction of the wicked. During this same time, however, Isaiah also prophesied that the Lord will gather his people and provide hope. Elder Bruce R. McConkie portrayed the circumstances described in 2 Nephi 15 using, modern, using words modern readers may understand. Quote, the vision of the future is not all sweetness and light and peace. All that is yet to shall go forth forward in the midst of great evils and perils and desolations that have been known on earth at any time. As the saints prepare to meet their God, so those who are carnal and sensual and devilish prepare to face their doom. As the meek men among men make their calling election sure, so those who worship the God of the world sink Satan, the God of this world, who is Satan, sink even lower and lower into the depths of depravity and despair. Amid tears of sorrow, our hearts are heavy with forebodings. We see evil and crime and carnality covering the earth. We see evil forces everywhere uniting to destroy the family, to ridicule morality and decency, to glorify all that is lewd, base. Satan reigns in the hearts of men. It is the great day of his power. But amid it all, the work of the Lord rolls on. Amid it all, there are revelations and visions and prophecies. There are gifts and signs and miracles. There is rich outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Amid it all, believing souls prepare themselves to dwell with God in Christ and holy beings in the eternal kingdoms. Is it any wonder that we both rejoice and tremble at what lies ahead? Truly, the world is and will be in commotion, but the Zion of God will be unmoved. The wicked and ungodly will be swept away from the church, and the little stone will continue to grow until it fills the whole earth. End of Elder McConkie's quote. <clears throat> so you can see why it is called a great and terrible day. Depending on how you used your agency, it will either be great or terrible for you when Christ comes again. Note, again, I note that much of the commentary and insights to this chapter comes from a book called Understanding Isaiah, written by Donald W. Perry, J.A. Perry, and Tina M. Peterson. Chapter 15, verse 1, the phrase, Will I Sing? Isaiah sings a song about the Lord and the house of of Israel. Vineyard refers to the house of Israel. This song can appropriately be applied to the Lord's covenant people in all ages. The word, phrase well beloved refers to the Lord of hosts who is the owner of the vineyard. Fertile hill is the promised covenant land of Israel where God planted his vineyard or the house of Israel. Chapter 15, verse 2, the phrase, he dug up the soil, refers to, and gathered out the stones. God provided the house of Israel with the choice promised land. The phrase, planted it with the choicest vines. God made Israel the choice vine so that she would be fruitful and become a righteous people among the nation. The word tower, referring to God built a tower in the vineyard so that watchmen could watch for impending danger and evil and then warn the children of Israel. 
The word wine press refers to God made a wine press in anticipation of a great harvest. The song contains powerful images that point to Jesus' atonement, the wine press, the fertile hill, and the grapes. All are symbols of Jesus' atoning sacrifice. Verse chapter 15, verse 4, the phrase, What could have done, what could have been done more to my vineyard? After doing all things possible to make his vineyard fruitful, the Lord asks, What could have been done more to my vineyard? Similarly, the Lord's great compassion is shown in the allegory of the olive tree. The Lord of the vineyard wept and said, What could I have done more for my vineyard? And you think of the atonement and his suffering and all that he went through in the garden and on the cross, brothers and sisters. What more could Jesus do for us? So now it is up to us to use our agency wisely. My vineyard referring to the house of Israel, which belongs to the Lord, as indicated by the pronoun my. Wild or sour grapes means this passage could mean stinking or worthless grapes. The vineyard was expected to yield good edible fruit. Instead, it produced rotten grapes, which symbolizes decay and evil people. Those who are rotten will not partake of the atonement and abide in Christ. For if we abide in Christ, we will bring forth good fruit. Those who are rotten will be trodden down by the Lord in great fury at the time of his second coming, causing his robes to be red. Isaiah uses third person per pronouns to refer to the Lord in 15.2. For example, he dug up the soil. In 15, 3 through 6, the Lord is represented by the first person pronoun, I. 15, verse 5, the phrase, it shall be eaten up, or could also be translated, burned. This is referring to, this refers to eventual burning of the wicked of Israel at the second coming. The phrase, take away the hedge and trodden down, meaning, the wall, hedge, and watchtower, three elements designed to protect a vineyard, signifies God's protection of the house of Israel. Nevertheless, God has removed them, verse 2, so that wild beasts and invading armies trample the vineyard. This is because the house of Israel became wicked in the land of Israel. Chapter 15, verse 6, the phrase, I will lay it waste, meaning it shall not be pruned or digged. Temporally, the vineyard becomes wasteland because the master of the vineyard determines he will no longer remove stones, continue to hoe and weed the land, work the soil, or prune the vines. Now briars and thorns overrun the choicest vine, and wild beasts enter the vineyard because the hedge has been removed and make it their habitation. Spiritually, the house of Israel, the vineyard, became a wasteland through apostasy and rejection of the kindness, love, and care of the master of the vineyard, who is Jehovah. God would not have laid waste the vineyard had it been fruitful. Briars and thorns, meaning transgressions, caused the land that we inhabit became wasteland covered with briars and thorns, represented the fallen condition of the telestial world and of its inhabitants. Clouds will rain, will not rain upon it. This refers to rain represents life, revelation, and the word of God. These have now been removed because of the apostasy of Israel. Chapter 15, verse 7, the phrase vineyard, pleasant plant. The vineyard represents the house of Israel. 15, verse 3, sorry, that should be 15. Chapter 15, verse 3. The pleasant plant refers to the inhabitants of the kingdom of Judah. The phrase looked for judgment slash righteousness means God wanted his people to be just and righteous, but instead he found bloodshed and cries of distress. Isaiah's use of Hebrew terms in this vineyard demonstrates his brilliant and elegant literary style. Note the similarity between the Hebrew words for judgment, which is pronounced mish, mishepat, and bloodshed, mishepach. Righteousness, 
Sadaka and cry Sadaka. Hence, Israel's message is clear. The, the, the people chose Mishpach bloodshed instead of Mishpat judgment. And Sadaka, Sadaka cry rather than Sadaka righteousness. Isaiah was a master of the Hebrew language. Chapter 15, verse 8, the word of woe. This means severe anguish and distress resulting from God's judgments, which will come upon the guilty in all ages of the world, including our own. The phrase house to house, perhaps this verse is an accusation against the rich who are covetous and oppress the poor to obtain lands and riches. Or it may speak of anyone who takes advantage of others for material gain. Chapter 15, verse 10, the phrase barrel of wine and bushel of grain, reading, the judgment against those identified in the first woe is that their houses will become desolate and their land will not bring forth normal amounts of produce. For 10 acres of vineyard will produce only one barrel of wine. Those who are house greedy and lung hung, land hungry will have neither house nor food. And so their production is very low compared to the amount of land that is harvested. Chapter 15, verse 11, the phrase strong drink or wine, meaning this indicates revelry and unholy merrymaking among those who spend excess amounts of time early in the morning, continuing until night, in carnal entertainment. This is reminiscent of, There shall be many which shall say, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it shall be well with us. Chapter 15, verse 12, The harp, the lyre, the tambourine, and the flute, meaning, In this context, these instruments may suggest worldly music and light-mindedness. Feast refers to, in this context, feast does not refer to re religious feasts and festivals, but to drunken revelry. The phrase, regards not the work of the Lord, meaning the people described here are concerned with their own pleasure and gratification rather than doing God's will. 15 verses 11 through 12, drunkenness and partying prevail with no regard to God, which leads to a lack of knowledge of truth and true principles. Ignorance is a hindrance in any field of endeavor, especially in spiritual things. The prophet Joseph Smith gave instruction on this important principle, quote, The church must be cleansed, and I proclaim against all iniquity. A man is saved no faster than he gets knowledge. For if he does not get knowledge, he will not be brought he will be brought into captivity by some evil power in the other world, as evil spirits will have more knowledge, and consequently more power than any many men who are on earth. Hence, it needs revelation to assist us and give us knowledge of things of God. End of quote. In order to be above Satan, I must gain more knowledge and become above him. Chapter 15, verse 13, Captivity. Because the people have no knowledge, especially of the Lord, and because they glory in debauchery and revelry, they are subject to spiritual and physical captivity. They have become past feeling because they have misused their agency. The phrase famished or thirst, this may refer to literal famine, but also has an important symbolic meaning. The honorable men, meaning the upper class and city dignitaries, and the multitude, meaning commoners, have no knowledge of the Lord and his gospel. They lack the words of the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing of the words of the Lord. Famous passage from Amos 8.11. Specifically, the wicked lack the wicked lack an understanding of Jesus Christ and the power of his atonement. They do not partake of the bread and the waters 
of life, which refer to Jesus Christ. Although they partake of strong drink and wine, they experience famine and thirst for spiritual things. By contrast, the righteous have the privilege of feasting on the words of Christ as well as on his love and of renewing their covenants by the sacrament. Chapter 15, verse 4, the phrase, Hell hath enlarged herself. The term hell, Hebrew Shiloh, Shiloh is thus, in this verse, refers to the world of spirits. Hell opens her mouth wide enough to receive all who are pompous and wicked, as well as their pomp and glory. Both the wicked and their evil traits will be cast down to hell. This open mouth image that is connected to hell continues the symbolism of feasting, strong drink, wine, and feast, and famine, famish, dried up with thirst. The wicked open their mouths as they eat, drink, and are merry, while at the same time, hell opens her mouth to swallow them. In the end, hell's mouth, not the mouth of the wicked, shall be filled. 15 verse 5, the common man, mighty man, shall be humbled. All wicked individuals, regardless of social status, will be humble when God's judgments come upon them. The phrase, eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, meaning the eyes of those who covet, lust, and are greedy. Chapter 15, verse 16, the Lord phrase, the Lord shall be exalted in judgment, meaning here exalted stands opposite in the words in 15, 15, sorry, that should be a 15. Oh, I apologize for the mix-up. In 15... Here we go, I apologize. Here exalted stands opposite the words in 1515 that describe the wicked man brought down and humbled twice. The phrase sanctified in righteousness, the New International Version, presents a better reading of this phrase, may, could be translated, God will show himself holy by his righteousness. 1518, the phrase they draw sin and iniquity with ropes of vanity. Isaiah 518 footnote C helps us explain Isaiah's idiomatic expression. Quote, they are tied to their sins like beasts to their burdens, unquote. The wicked are burdened with sins and they must drag behind them just as a beast of burden hauls its load from place to place. The verse also seems to suggest that vanity is the key component from which our cords are made. We commit a sin and then drag it after us because of our vain vanity and pride. It keeps us from repentance. Vanity also means uselessness or emptiness. An interesting image. Sin is something as diff sin is sometimes as difficult to break as a thick rope that is strong enough to pull a cart. But it is possible to break sin with the help of Christ. He said, Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. President Harold B. Lee described how sin is like a burden. Quote, if I were to ask you what is the heaviest burden one may have to bear in this life, what would be your answer? The heaviest burden that one has to bear in this life is the burden of sin. End of quote. 15 verse 19. They mock God by asking him to show he is God and his work in succeeding. So they are asking for signs. 15 verse 20, they pervert righteousness and goodness, calling them evil, and try to pass off evil things as good. It is the nature of sinners to reject the reality of the consequences of their transgressions, and so they attempt to explain them away. The preventing of all moral distinctions. Wicked ways are often confused with moral values by those who believe they know more than God or his prophets. They are deceived, or they seek to justify themselves 
in their disobedience. Sin is accepted in the world, and evil becomes an acceptable way of life. See, Satan cannot cause us to do anything that is good. That's in Moroni chapter uh, 10. No, Moroni chapter 7. Read in there, Satan cannot cause us to do good. Therefore, he must make evil look like good. That way, those who are doing evil think they are doing good. And that's why he must make good look evil. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency described the importance of seeing clearly and choosing the right from wrong. Quote, the gap between what is popular and what is righteous is widening. As prophesied by Isaiah, many call evil good and good evil. Revelations from the prophets of God are not like offerings at the cafeteria, some to be selected and others disregarded. End of quote. We are to obey all of God's words. Chapter 15, verse 21, they are wise in their own eyes, meaning President and Elder Tanner illustrated the necessity of heeding this warning. He noted that when people, quote, become learned in worldly things such as science and philosophy, they become self-sufficient or prepared to learn unto their own understanding. I'm sorry, they are prepared to lean unto their own understanding, even to the point where they think they are independent of God. And because of their worldly leaning, they feel that if they cannot prove physically, mathematically, or scientifically that God lives, they can and should feel free to question and even deny God and Jesus Christ. Then many of our professors begin to teach perverse things to lead away disciples after them, and our youth whom we send to them for learning accept them as authority, and many are caused to lose their faith in God. How much wiser and better it is for man to accept the simple truths of the gospel and to accept as authority God, the creator of the world, and his son Jesus Christ, and to accept by faith those teachings which he cannot prove and for which he cannot give a better explanation. He must be prepared to acknowledge that there are certain things, many, many things, that he cannot understand. End of quote. God has given us enough knowledge so that we can be saved. And then after that, if we are proven faithful, then we will certainly come to know all things and have all answers. Chapter 15, verse 2, the phrase, mighty to drink wine. A phrase describing the lifestyle of those who reject God and think that they themselves are God in the world. Chapter 15, verse 23, the phrase, they justify the wicked for reward. Those who are guilty of crimes were declared innocent by bribed judges and other officials, whereas the innocent were found guilty so that they could be silenced or their property exploited. Boy, does that apply today? This is applied to ancient Israel. You see this same today. Obviously, the dark evils that prevailed among the Israelites of the ancient kingdom of Judah help modern readers understand why the judgments of God come upon them. But today's world can also learn a great lesson, for one need only look to see the same evils prevailing on many sides. The effects of sin today are as devastating as they were anciently. That is the message of Isaiah for today. That is why Isaiah and his judgment and the wickedness that he describes to ancient Israel that Judah and Ephraim committed, the two kingdoms, applies to us because Israel is committing these same sins today. Chapter 15, 24 through 25, the word therefore. Therefore, Jehovah will send destruction by fire and justice, and his justice, which is his anger, will prevail. The anger of God is just his righteous use of justice. 
Verse 24, the word flame slash fire, meaning filthy people, shall go away into everlasting fire prepared for them. And the torment is as a lake of fire burning with brimstone, whose flame ascendeth up forever and ever and hath no end. Further, all corruptible beings will be burned with fire at the Lord's coming. Behold, they shall be a stubble, and, sh and the fire shall burn them. The word stubble slash chaff means are symbols of the wicked. Root slash blossoms, the root has reference to one's parentage and blossoms to offspring. The unrepentant wicked will not enjoy family ties in the eternities. The phrase cast away the law of the Lord, meaning unrighteous individuals often throw God's law away as if it were more important, if it were no more important or significant in common household garbage. Their reward is to be cast away themselves. In verse 25, the phrase anger and kindled is this idiom which likens God anger to fire is common in Joseph Smith's revelations. The Lord's anger is always directed towards the wicked and the rebellious. He will pour out righteous judgments against them. The phrase stretched forth his hand against them. This idiom means that God sends forth his power or his judgments against the wicked. Hills did tremble, meaning both humanity and the earth's elements react to the great glory, majesty, and presence of God. A verity of scripture explains, or, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble, the nations may tremble at thy presence, and let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. The phrase, the carcasses were torn, perhaps this phrase describes a result of war. The phrase, his hand is stretched out still. This poetic refrain located in Isaiah 9, 12, 17, 21, and 10, 4 may signify one of two very different things. Although God is angry with his people for their sins and rebellion, he still stretches out his hand in mercy to his children. See this interpretation, see 2 Nephi 28, 32. Or the Lord's hand is stretched out in delivering destruction to the people. For this interpretation, see Ezekiel 6.14. The translation of today's English version of the Bible in this instance supports the second interpretation. It says, yet even so the Lord's anger is not ended. His hand is stretched out to punishment, as does the Jerusalem Bible, which says, Yet his anger is not spent. Still his hand is raised to strike. Chapter 15, verses 26 through 30. What does it mean to hiss to the nations? This expression describes a signal, such as a whistle to summon or alert someone to an event. Two divine activities that will attract members of the house of Israel to the gathering places or lands of promise, God will hold up a flag or a standard unto the nations of the earth around which Israel may rally, and God will attract the attention of God through a hiss or a whistle. A third divine activity is listed in a latter section of Isaiah. God will cause a trumpet to be blown, which will serve as a signal for the tribes of, together around the ensign. These three activities symbolize the manner which the earth inhabitants will be called to Zion in the latter days, after they accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the banner that is lifted up, or the ensign is lifted up, is the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then we send out missionaries, and as members, we hiss, or give the signal, that the store church has been restored and bear our testimonies. And so we are the hissers, that, or the whistle, or the trumpet that is being blown to bring people to the standard or into the church. Chapter 15, verse 26, They who accept Jesus as their God and the Savior and believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God will quickly gather in Zion. The scattering of Israel took place over many generations of time, but the gathering of Israel, which began at the beginning of the dispensation of the fullness of times, is presently taking place with great speed. 
Today, tens of thousands join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints annually. 15 verse 27, nothing will impede those who come to Zion. The saints will not be weary, stumble, or sleep, and their loins will be girded, their shoes will be latched. Verse 28 in chapter 15, and their equipment and vehicles will be ready and prepared. Chapter 15, verse 29, those who gather to Zion are compared to a strong and mighty lion in its prime, who roars, catches its prey, and carries it away with not a fear. 15, verse 30, the children of Zion, armed with the Spirit and his gifts, and possessing great priesthood powers, are mightier than the great roaring of the earth's oceans. The repetition of roaring is suggestive of that power. The land of the wicked will contain great sin and wickedness to the point of darkness and sorrow. The spiritual light from heaven will not be found among the unrighteous because it will be centered on Zion's people and their temples. President Joseph Fielding Smith defined the meaning of the ensign spoken of Isaiah, quote, over 125 years ago in the little town of Fayette, Seneca County, New York, the Lord set up an ensign to the nation. It was a fulfillment of the prediction made by the prophet Isaiah, which I have read, which was Isaiah 11, 11 through 12. That end sign was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which was established for the last time, never again to be destroyed or given to another people. It was the greatest event the world has seen since the day the Redeemer was lifted upon the cross and worked out the infinite atonement. It meant more to mankind than anything else that has occurred since that day. Elder Grand Richards, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, gives an interesting interpretation of horses' hooves like flint, wheels like a whirlwind, roaring like a lion. He suggests possibly the symbolism for Isaiah in verses 2 Nephi 15, 20 through 29. He directs our attention to the great missionary library taking place in our time. Quote, in fixing the time of the great gathering, Isaiah seems to indicate it would take place in the day of railroad trains and airplanes. Since there was neither trains nor airplanes in the, that day, Isaiah could hardly have mentioned them by name. However, he seems to have described them in unmistakable words. How better could their horses' hooves be counted like flint and the wheels like a whirlwind than in the modern train? How better could their roaring be like a lion than the roar of the airplane? Trains and airplanes do not stop for night. Therefore was not Isaiah justified in saying, None shall slumber nor sleep, neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. With this manner of transportation, the Lord can really hiss unto them from the ends of the earth, that they shall come with speed swiftly, indicating that Isaiah must have first seen the airplane, he stated, when he stated, Who are these that fly as a cloud and as the doves of their windows? That's in Isaiah 60, verse 8. So that's a very in interesting interpretation in this last part of the chapter of Isaiah 15, or 2 Nephi 15, Isaiah 5. Let's now go to 2 Nephi 16, which is compared to Isaiah 6. 2 Nephi 16, Isaiah's call to prophesy. Isaiah described his call to be a prophet of the Lord to all of Israel in symbolic language, using imagery and terms that the readers could identify with. His call included a vision of Jehovah, the ministry of angels, recognition of his mortal weaknesses in contrast with the glory of Jehovah, and acceptance of a call after a cleansing and, spirit and strengthening spiritual experience. Joseph Smith informs us that Isaiah's vision was connected to the experience wherein his calling and election was made sure, and he was given the gift of the second comforter, Jesus Christ. Chapter 16, verse 1, the year that King Uzziah died. 
Uzziah, king of Judah, died in 740 B.C. It is evidenced in this verse that Isaiah wants his readers to note that he received a vision of the heavenly king in the same year that the earthly king died. The word throne, meaning Isaiah saw the throne room, the holy of holies of the temple in heaven. For prophetic description of the heavenly throne, you can refer to the Ezekiel and Revelation Doctrine Covenant verses that are listed here. The phrase high and lifted up, meaning God is greater, more exalted than all creatures. Elsewhere, Isaiah calls God the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Train or hem of his robe. This speak of the Lord's flowing temple robes. God is clothed with purity, yea, even with the robe of righteousness, as are his holy saints. The image of the hems of God's robes filling the temple is used to symbolize the purity, righteousness, and power of the Lord that fills the temple. The word temple, the temple in heaven, was likely accessed through the earthly temple, which in Isaiah's case was located in Jerusalem. How do we enter the holy temple in celestial kingdom and exaltation? By going to the earthly temples and keeping our covenants that we make there. 16 verse 2, the word seraphim. Seraphs are angels who reside in the presence of God, having continual glory, honor, and adoration to him. The term seraphim comes from the Hebrew word sarap, which means to burn, and refers to a class of angels who are located in the celestial kingdom. English translations of its plural form may read burning ones or bright shining ones, both of which describe their glorious condition and location near God's throne. A modern revelation speaks of the bright shining seraphs around God's throne who shout acclamations of praise singing Hosanna to God and the Lamb, some of whom are premortal spirits. Six wings, meaning each living being seen by Ezekiel and John in their visions also had wings. The seraph's wings are probably not literal, but may be a representation of power to move and act. That is described in DNC 77 verse 4. Covered his face and feet, perhaps the seraphim covered their faces to protect themselves from the glory of God, which was present in the throne room of the celestial temple. Chapter 16 verse 3, seraphim cried unto another. Like the living creatures in Revelation 4-5, through the seraphim have the capacity to communicate with God and to worship Him as indicated by their words of praise, holy, 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 directed to their Lord. Holy, 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 this threefold exclamation plays a significant role in Isaiah and John the Revelator's vision of the heavenly temple. This cry of holy, holy, holy may point to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Also in Hebrew, the Hebrew does not have a way to show like holy, most holy, and the most holy. And so to, weigh, to say the most holy would be to say holy three times. Chapter 16, verse 4, the post of the door moved, quaking after often accompanies God's presence, and here the temple posts move or shook. The word house, in ancient Near East, it was common to call the sacred temple a house. Smoke, presumably smoke originated from the altar of incense, and it represents the prayer of the saints. Similarly, John the Revelator beheld the temple in heaven in vision and knew that it was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. The smoke may also be connected with the eternal fires found in heaven. Joseph Smith said, quote, God Almighty himself dwells in eternal fire. Flesh and blood cannot go there, for all corruption is devoured by the fire. Our God is a consuming fire. End of quote. That's why his very coming kills the telestial. Those who are living in terrestrial and celestial law will be protected of that burning fire of his presence by the Holy Ghost. Those who are telestial will be killed and burnt literally by his coming because it is a consuming fire to telestial people. 
16, verse 5, woe. As Isaiah stood before the king of the Lord of hosts, he was painfully aware of his frailties and weaknesses as a human mortal, and thus exclaimed, woe is me. The phrase, I am undone, the literal reading is, I am destroyed or I am lost. Perhaps Isaiah felt unworthy or overwhelmed to find himself in the presence of the Lord. Like Moses, he recognized his status in comparison to God's. Unclean lips, meaning inasmuch as all save Jesus Christ have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Isaiah too has unclean lips and has to be cleansed, meaning he is also mortal and needs cleansing because all mortals come short of the glory of God. Likewise, Joseph Smith went through a purifying process. Mine eyes have seen the king, meaning Isaiah, like many prophets, saw Jesus Christ. Nephi wrote, and now I, Nephi, write more words of Isaiah, for he very, for verily he saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him, and my brother Jacob also has seen him, as I have seen him. The word king, Jesus, who is called king of kings, sits on the throne in the throne room of the heavenly temple. There is a direct connection between the Lord's temple and kingship. Jesus was the heir to the throne, and we through his atonement may become joint heirs with Christ and sit on the throne with him and the Father. Boy, what greater blessings could you ask for? 16 verse 6, the live coal, meaning the burning coal from the altar of sacrifice, purified Isaiah so he could enter God's presence. The live coal represents the Holy Ghost who purifies and purges us, making it possible for us to enter God's presence. The altar, this refers to the altar of sacrifice. 16 verse 7, mouth lips. Although it was only Isaiah's mouth and lips that are touched, his entire soul was cleansed. He has been atoned and can thus become a tool for the Lord, using his mouth and lips and bearing testimony to the people and in teaching them of truth. 16 verse 8, the phrase, Whom shall I send? Isaiah, who also answered his prophetic call from the Lord with, Here am I, was responding to the Lord following an ancient pattern. In this setting, Isaiah also becomes a type of Christ. Send where? Isaiah is sent to the world to bear witness of Christ and declare his word. The phrase, who will go for us? Go where? Isaiah is sent to go among the people of his day to proclaim God's word of warning and judgment. The plural pronoun us suggests that there were other in God's heavenly throne room. In John's vision of the heavenly temple, we read of exalted saints and other near God's throne in heaven. The phrase, here am I, means this saying is often connected to the calling of the Lord's servants. It seems to have the meaning of, I am ready to obey your commandments concerning me. You remember Moses says that, here am I. In other words, he is saying, I am ready. 16 verses 9 through 11 the phrase, hear ye indeed, but they understood not. Verse 9, Isaiah was commissioned to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though the people were hard of hearing and failed to see the truth of the gospel. He was advised that his preaching to a wayward people would generally not be received. Verse 10, their hearts would fatten against the truth and their ears would be heavy, not willing to accept the gospel as preached in clarity. Isaiah was not commissioned to make the people resistant to the truth. Rather, he was advised of the difficulty of his mission. The phrase, heart of this people fat, meaning the book of Matthew clarifies this people. This people's heart is wax gross, which means their hearts have become hardened through their own wickedness, not through the agency of Isaiah or the Lord. Even so, an 
answer to Isaiah's query for how long, the Lord answered that the people should have the opportunity to accept the gospel until the land become utterly desolate. Desolation and destruction always attend wickedness. The Lord will graciously continue his mission of salvation through his servants so long as time shall last, on earth shall stand, or there shall be one man upon the face thereof to be saved. Jo uh, Joseph Smith commented on these verses of Isaiah, quote, And the disciple came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? I would here remark that uh, them used, made use of in this interrogation. In inter interrogation is a personal pronoun and refers to the multitude. He answered and said unto them, that is, unto the disciples, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But unto them, that is, the unbelievers, it is not given. For whosoever hath, he shall be given, and he shall have more in abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. We understand from this saying that those who had been previously looking for a Messiah to come, according to the testimony of the prophets, and were then at that time looking for a Messiah, but had not sufficient light on account of their unbelief to discern him to be their Savior, and he being the true Messiah, consequently, they must be disappointed and lose even all the knowledge, or have taken away from them all the light and understanding and faith which they had upon this subject. Therefore, he that hath will not receive greater light, must have taken away from him all the light which he hath. And if that life which is in you become a darkness, behold, how great is that darkness. Therefore, says the Savior, spake I unto them parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And then in them is fulfilled the prophet of Isaiah, meaning Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and ye shall not understand, and ye seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. And so that's why they did not understand Isaiah, and he used such imagery and wording that only those who are righteous would see. Just like in the parables, only the righteous would come to know what the parables meant. Only those who come to God and receive revelation will come to know Isaiah and what he is preaching. Now we discover that the very reason assigned by this prophet why they would not receive the Messiah was because they did not or would not understand and seeing they did not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But what saith he to his disciples? Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and not heard them. End of Joseph Smith's quote. 16 verse 12, the phrase, Lord hath removed men far away, refers to, the Lord exiled his people. It was the custom of Assyria and the Babylonian nations, which served as instruments in God's hand to deport the peoples whom they conquered. Destruction and deportation of the wicked go hand in hand. They would deport the wealthy, the healthy, the artisan, the worker, the poor, and the elderly they left behind because they were of no use to them. Chapter 16, verse 13, the word holy seed means the use of tent in 2 Nephi 16, 3 represents a remnant of the house of Israel. Tree, till tree and oak, Israel is likened to trees that are cut down or destroyed and become as stumps. Holy seed refers to the faithful remnant that will regenerate new life out of scattered Israel like new branches growing from the stump of a tree that has been cut down. Now let's go to 2 Nephi 17, which is compared to Isaiah 7. 
As with many of Isaiah's prophecies, there was a fulfillment during his own time, which is shown in the history of ancient Israel and Judah. A careful reading of 2 Nephi 17 through 24, which is all Isaiah chapters, chapters 7 through 14, together with the chapter introductions, teach that Isaiah's prophecies also relate to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the judgments that precede that wonderful anticipated event. Elder Alan Dallin H. Oaks, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, noted that the multiple fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies is its succeeding generations and the role of the Holy Ghost in understanding these important writings. The book of Isaiah contains numerous prophecies that seem to have multiple fulfillments. One seems to involve the people of Isaiah's day or the second circumstances of the next generation. Another meaning, often symbolic, seems to refer to events in the meridian of time. Still another meaning or fulfillment of the same prophecy seems to relate to the events attending the second coming of the Savior. The fact that many of these prophecies can have multiple meanings underscores the importance of our seeking revelation from the Holy Ghost to help us interpret them. End of quote. 17 verses 1 through 9. The prophecy in this section was delivered on the occasion of Isaiah's first interview with King Ahaz after the first alarm had reached Jerusalem that invasion was imminent. 17 verses 1 through 2. The king was apparently supervising the measures being taken to ensure a water supply for the city in the event of a siege when the prophet received the commandment to go with his son, Sher Yeshub, Sher Yeshub, whose name who was named prophetically Hebrew, a remnant shall return, so that's what it means, was the son of Isaiah and the prophetess and the elder brother of Mahar Sha'al Hashbahaz. The boy was to become a living symbol to the Jews and a reminder to the Israels that a remnant would return to the land their God. Ahaz may have been at the pool with his officers to check Jerusalem's water supply for the pending siege. The Lord, who knew Isaiah's location, inspired Isaiah to go with his son, that to go there with his son, Sher Yeshub. Razin, king of Syria, and Pekah, king of e Israel, tried to persuade Ahaz, king of Judah, to ally with them against Assyria, their neighboring superpower. Meanwhile, Isaiah pleaded with Ahaz to trust the Lord for deliverance from the invading armies, not to go in alliance with the other kingdoms. Ahaz rejected Isaiah's counsel, spiritual counsel and won the support of Tiglath-Pileser III, king of Assyria, whom in 730 BC invaded the northern kingdom of Israel and captured many cities. Because Ahaz rejected Isaiah's plan, the armies of Razin and Pekah Pekah invaded Judah, slew over 130,000 warriors, and carried away some 200,000 women and children. Judah was slaughtered part because in part of the great sin of her king and her people. And Judah became a vassal state, paying tribute to Assyria to escape the threat of Syria and is to, to escape the threat of Syria and Israel. Chapter 17, verse 3, Isaiah delivers God's word to Ahaz, telling him that the two invading kings are but like blazing firebrands, which will soon be burned out, and that Syria's plan to rule Judah, dethrone Ahaz, and replace a king on Judah's throne will not succeed. Thus, King Ahaz had no need to fear the power of the kings of Syria and Israel, for the day of their power were, number, power were numbered. 17 verse 4, Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remalia make evil plans to go up against Judah. 17 verse 5, they wanted to vex Judah and cause her sickening dread. These powers wanted to conquer Judah to expand their territory and dominion by placing one of their own, a puppet king, the son of Tibal, Talbil, over the land. 17 verse 6, which the Lord explains will not work. 
God, who is omnipotent and in charge of the affairs of humanity, sees the future. The plans of Syria, Ephraim, and Pekah, the son of Remalia, will not succeed. Chapter 17, verse 7, not only does God reveal to his prophets what will happen in the future, but he tells them what will not happen, neither shall it not come, neither, neither shall it come to pass. 17, verse 8, the phrase head of Damascus refers to Damascus located on the foot of Mount Hermon, Hermon was the capital head of Syria, and Damascus' king head was Razim. Damascus was captured by the Assyrian army led by tiglath pileser Three score and five years means Isaiah's prophecy that Ephraim would no longer be a king or a nation was fulfilled when Ephraim fell in 721 B.C. King Sargon, the second of Assyria, deported her citizens the ten tribes of Israel to the north countries. Chapter nine, verse seventeen, verse nine. The head of Ephraim is Syria. This all refers to Samaria was the capital or head of the northern kingdom of Israel, or Ephraim, where most of the kings of Israel resided. The king or head of Samaria was Pekah. The phrase, if you will not believe, means if, I, if Ahaz and Judah would not believe in Jehovah and have faith in Isaiah's prophecy, then Ahaz's kingship and kingdom would not remain on the earth. Chapter 17, 10 through 14, the phrase, the Lord himself should give you a sign. The Hebrew for, word, for virgin, Alma, literally means young woman, also having the connotation of a virgin. Emmanuel, a name for Christ, comes from the words in Hebrew that mean God with us. Emmanuel is a name title given as a sign of God's deliverance. Isaiah's reference to Emmanuel had both a possible historic meaning and a prophetic meaning. It is most immediate meaning it could indicate a child to be born in Isaiah's time whose coming of age operated as a sign because the sign was given in part to nurture Ahaz's faith, it would have had some fulfillment in his lifetime. The lesser fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy thus pertains to Isaiah's wife, the prophetess, who also fulfills the conditions of Isaiah's prophecy when she brought forth a son. Isaiah, the prophetess, their son, and the conditions surrounding his birth all point to the birth of Jesus Christ. In its more important prophetic meaning, Israel is specifically identified by Matthew as a prophecy of Jesus' birth into mortality. The name also appears in Latter-day Scripture. Isaiah's language is in both passages of Scripture, was deliberately designed to show that the first fulfillment of the manual prophecy was connected to himself, his wife, and their son, all of whom were signs to Israel. God with us was meant to reassure King Ahaz that if he turned to the Lord, then God would help them. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how this also became another type and shadow of the Savior. Quote, there are plural or parallel elements of this prophecy, as with so much of Isaiah's writing. The most immediate meaning was probably focused on Isaiah's wife, a pure and good woman, who brought forth a son about this time, the child becoming a type and a shadow of the greater later fulfillment of the prophecy that would be realized in the birth of Jesus Christ. The symbolism in the dual prophecy acquires additional importance when we realize that Isaiah's wife may have been of royal blood, and therefore her son will have been royalty of the line of David. Here again is a type, a prefiguration of the greater Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, the ultimate son of the David, the royal king who would be born of a literal virgin. Indeed, his title, Emmanuel, would be carried forward to the latter days being applied to the Savior in sections 128 verse 22 of the Doctrine and Covenants. End of quote. And so in this little diagram, you see the theme here is that there's a mother. 
she conceives and has a child, and then it's a male child, and then they name the son. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14 through 17, refers to that a virgin, and she conceives and bears a son and calls his name Emmanuel. In Isaiah 8, verses 3 through 7, this is now referring to Isaiah's wife, the prophetess. So she fulfills this prophecy. She conceives, she bears his name, and calls his name Maher Sha'al Hashbaz. This is now a type and is fulfilled in Matthew 1, 21, where she, Mary, brings forth, she conceives, a son, and calls his name Jesus Emmanuel. So this shows you how Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled in two different time periods, through Isaiah's wife and then later through Mary and Joseph. Chapter, 12, chapter 17, verse 12, Neither will I tempt the Lord. Apparently Ahaz was afraid to ask the Lord for a sign. Perhaps he knew that Israel had often been accused of testing the Lord, or he was spiritually dead and a non-believer and saying this out of sarcasm, or he was afraid of the sign that and what it would mean. It is also possible the reason Ahaz did not want a sign was because he did not want the Lord interfering in his plan to make an alliance with other nations, which Isaiah specifically warned him not to do. 17 verse 13, the phrase, Hear ye now, O house of David, meaning the sign was not for Ahaz only, but the plural ye and the phrase house of David indicated that the sign was given to all the people of of the kingdom. Chapter 17, verse 15, butter and honey. These are the basics of a pastoral culture. 17, verses 16 through 22, the destruction of Ephraim and Syria. Ephraim is the northern kingdom of Israel. In contrast to the promise that Judah would not totally perish, Isaiah prophesied that the fall of the northern kingdom, the land that thou hoardest, which opposed Ahaz. 16, seven, uh, should be 17, verse 16. Bef the before the child shall know. The prophecy explains that before the child is able to make his own moral choices or arrives at the age of accountability, which is eight years old, the kingdom of Syria and Israel, northern kingdom, will be laid waste. The two kingdoms in the north at the time were put to death by the Assyrians. The two nations of Ephraim and Syria would be destroyed by Syria would be destroyed by Assyria. Syria's destruction came in 732 BC and Ephraim's followed in 722 BC. So this is referring to that child. Maharsha al Hashbaaz, that Isaiah's wife has. That, that was a sign if Ahaz would believe that when that child is born and before it can uh, arise at the age of accountability, he, this child is a sign that the northern kingdom would be destroyed. 17 verse 7, 7, 17, verse 17 the Lord shall bring upon thee the king of Assyria. Meaning, inasmuch as Ahaz, most of the people of Israel rejected the Lord and turned to idolatry and other gross sins, the Lord will use the king of Assyria and his armies to punish King Ahaz, his family upon the father's house, and his kingdom upon the people. Note the active role played by God who will bring upon Ahaz, king and his kingdom, the king of Assyria. In 2 Nephi 25 through 26, God says he will use the Assyrians as his staff to beat the people. The phrase, days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, meaning that the disaster that came upon the kingdom of Judah is compared to the rebellion of the ten tribes under Jeroboam's leadership in 1 Kings 12. Israel had not had days so severe since that rebellion. Chapter 17, verse 18, the Lord shall whistle or hiss. The Lord will signal or prompt the Assyrian armies, here referred to as bees, to come down on Judah. 
the Lord shall whistle to the bees in a symbol built on an actual ancient practice. For Cyrillus of Alexandria wrote about beekeepers who whistled to bees to get them to return to their hives. Fly slash bee, this refers to fighting soldiers. These symbols are well chosen, for the flooding of the Nile brought swarms of fly eyes. The hills of districts of Assyria were well known for their bees. The phrase rivers of Egypt slash land of Assyria means Assyria's domination and power would reach as far south as the rivers of Egypt, and Assyria would even rule Egypt for a brief period during the following century. Chapter 17, verse 9, Valley rocks, thorns, bushes. Just as the bee and the fly are able to penetrate every area of valley, rocks, thorns, and bushes, so too the Assyrian soldiers penetrated every area of the kingdom of Judah. So you can see that Jehovah is using the kingdom of Assyria to punish the kingdom of Judah. Notice how Christ is in control. Christ is in control of all nations and armies here in mortality. Chapter 17, verse 20, shave with a razor means the Assyrian king and his armies represent the Lord's hired razor. The symbol of the razor refers to the fact that the Assyrians forced war prisoners to become slaves, humiliating and dishonoring them by shaving them from head to toe. Hence the fly and the bee metaphor in 718 and the razor metaphor foretell that no part of the land, no part of the person will be free of enemy occupation. 17 verse 21, the phrase, nourish a young cow and two sheep. This speaks of the poverty of those who remain in Judah after the Assyrian invasion. Residents who are permitted to remain in the land will be poor in comparison to the pre-war years. They will no longer possess large herds of cattle or large vineyards. They will only own two sheep and a young cow, and they will find it a struggle to nourish their livestock. 17 verse 22, Abundance of Milk Ancient Israel was called a land flowing with milk and honey to symbolize its fertile and productive nature. But all that remains now is butter and wild honey. Fresh milk in abundance is gone. Only a milk product, butter, which can be stored longer than fresh milk, remains. Butter slush honey refers to those who are not deported by Assyria and thus remain in Israel or eat the very basics of a pastoral culture, which is butter and honey. Produce, grains, fruits, and other items will no longer be available because of the war-torn status of the community, economic upheaval, and the lack of cultivated lands. 1723, Thousand Vines. A vineyard with a thousand vines is very large. The fruits and benefits of horticulture will be lost with a serious invasion. The richest vines will become worthless, and briars and thorns will be found in place of vineyards. 17 verse 24, arrows slash bows. Inasmuch as vineyards, verse 23, and cultivated lands, verse 25, will be gone, hunters with their bows and arrows will roam the land to seek their prey. The phrase land shall become briars and thorns means the phrase briars and thorns occurs three times in this section. Because of the lack of cultivation and care for pasture, the land will become full of briars and thorns. 17 verse 25, dig with the hoe, meaning as the vineyards will be taken over by briars and thorns, so will other cultivated land. Such desolation in verse 21 through 25 are symbolic of the judgment the people will receive for their pride and sin. Let's now go to 2 Nephi chapter 18, which is comparable to Isaiah verse 8. 2 Nephi 18, Assyria, the Lord's Instrument. Chapters 18 of 2 Nephi is a continuation of the historical events introduced in chapter 17. Again, Isaiah warned Judah against alliances because, as he prophesied, they would be ineffective. Messianic promised an Emmanuel, God with us, would prevail in their behalf. So that Emmanuel prophecy, God will be with us, 
applied in Isaiah's time and then in the meridian of time referring to the birth of Jesus Christ. The Assyrian invasion would come, but Judah would still survive. Isaiah concluded his writings with a warning against the false teachings and practices that would pull Judah away from the commandments that had been revealed to them. Isaiah represents three images of Christ that have special meaning for us today, water, temple, and light. First, Jesus is as essential to our spiritual salvation as water is to our physical salvation. That is to say, without water, we will die physically. Without Christ, we will die spiritually. Second, we will find peace and comfort in Jesus Christ if we permit him to be our temple, the focus of our worship, our cornerstone, the chief part of the building, and our sure foundation, where we can find sure footing. Third, as we walk through mortality, which is light passing in the shadow or in darkness, we receive great hope, comfort, and joy when we accept Jesus as our great light. Chapter 18, verse 1, the phrase, a great roll or tablet. On a large tablet, Isaiah wrote down, name, name, down wrote down the name by which his son would be called, probably to indicate that the inscription was intended for a public display. This action, along with the testimony of two witnesses, would make the prophecy fulfillment of the sign of Ahaz public knowledge. The phrase man's pen, this was probably a stylus or a graver used to inscribe stone, metal, or clay. Mahar Sha'al Hashbaaz, the son of Isaiah and the prophetess, the younger brother of Sher Yeshub, both Israel's sons share prophetic qualities in the book of Isaiah. Mahar Sha'al Hashbaaz may also have been called Emmanuel. The prophetic nature of the name Mahar Sha'al Hashbaz, which means to speed, spoil, hasten, plunder, is explained in 18 verse 4. For before the child shall have known to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away from before the king of Assyria. That is, Mahar Sha'al Hashbaz is a living sign of the greater quickness, speed, or hasten with which Assyria would plunder and spoil the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria, and Syria, the king capital, Damascus. So Mahar Sha'al Hashbahaz, which means to spoil, to, to speed, spoil, and plunder, he was a sign to them that when this child is born, that Assyria's coming to destroy the northern kingdom is quickly coming. The repetition of speed and hasten in the son's name emphasized the swiftness by which the sign will be fulfilled, meaning before the baby Mahar Shal Ashbahaz can utter the words father or mother. Mahar Shal Ashbahaz is a type of Jesus Christ. Both Mahar Shal Ashbahaz and Christ possess prophetic names. The name Mahar Shal Ashbaz has four parts, similar to the four titles found, four titles of Jesus found in 2 Nephi 19.6. Both were named by revelation from God, and both entered the world during the times of political upheaval and warfare. Mahar Shal Ashbaz prophesied the manner in which Israel would be speedily destroyed and then plunder. Likewise, Jesus Christ will come down to judge the world and speedily destroy those who are wicked. Jewish tradition holds that the prophetess belonged to a royal line, as we indicated. If this is indeed true, the Mahar Shal Hashbaz was of royal lineage, as was Jesus Christ. 18 verse 2, the phrase faithful witness, Uriah the priest, and Zechariah. Uriah was a well-known figure who worked as a priest in the Jerusalem temple. Little is known of Zechariah other than that he was the son of Jebberachiah and was considered to be a faithful witness. He may have been the same Zechariah who was King Ahaz's father-in-law and the grandfather to King Hezekiah. The fact that Isaiah would have two witnesses as required by law 
to the inscription of his son's name on tablets in the case that he wanted the public to know that the Lord had indeed fulfilled the sign in 2 Nephi 7, 14 through 16. The two witnesses later testify that Isaiah himself had described the tablet and confirmed the subscription. I think that's supposed to be chapter 17. That prophecy of the Emmanuel prophecy. Oh, yeah. Let's get that right. Sorry. <clears throat> 18 verse 3, prophetess. The term prophetess refers to Isaiah's wife. She may have had prophetic, prophetic ability, and her son is probably the initial fulfillment of the prophecy recorded in 2 Nephi 17, 14. According to Revelation 19.10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thus, calling Isaiah's wife a prophetess would be saying that she had a testimony of Jesus. She typified the Virgin Mary. 18 verse 4, the phrase to cry, my father and my mother, means Isaiah's prophecy concerning the pending invasion of Assyria will be fulfilled within two or three years. The time element is set forth in the prophecy that Assyria will capture Damascus, Syria, Samaria, and Israel before Maharshal Hasbaz is able to say, my father and my mother. Younger children are able to say simple phrases such as mother or father, my mother, my father or my mother near the age of two. The prophecy was fulfilled in 734-732 when tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, captured Galilee region, the Jezreel Valley, and Transjordan and plundered their riches. The phrase riches of Damascus, spoils of Samaria, means after conquering Syria and Israel, the Assyrian army seized their personal and, pub seized their personal and public wealth. Tiglath Pleasar III recorded in his royal chronicle that Israel, with all its inhabitants and its good, I led to Assyria. It's 18 verses 6 through 7. This people, meaning the people of Israel, or any people who refuse to live, who refuse the living waters of Christ. The phrase, the waters of Shiloh, that go softly, it means this refers to Christ, who is the fountain of all righteousness and the fountain of living waters. The image of water is symbolic of Jesus because he cleanses the righteous who enter the waters of baptism. He also invites us to drink from the waters of salvation, which forever quench the thirst of those who partake. One commentary explains the possible meaning of the comparison between the waters of Shiloh that go softly and the strong and many waters of the river. Quote, Isaiah described and then contrast two forms of waters, the soft rolling waters of Shiloh located near the Temple Mount of Jerusalem and the waters of the Euphrates, a great river that often floods out of control. The waters of Shiloh are controlled and inviting, whereas the Euphrates is dangerous and destructive. The waters of Shiloh bring life to those who drink them. The Euphrates bring death to those who are swept away in its flood. Isaiah's image of the two waters are symbolic. The former represents Jesus, the King of Heaven, who is likened to the waters of life, and later is the King of Assyria, who leads his great destructive armies and covers the earth like a flood and destroys the inhabitants thereof. Inasmuch as the inhabitants of Judah had rejected Jesus or the waters of Shiloh, the Lord set upon them the king of Assyria or the mighty and the strong and mighty waters of river of that of the river that would overflow their banks and cover the entire land with destruction. 18 verse 8, the word neck meant the neck is a metaphor for the upper reaches of the land. Hence, Assyria's army will destroy the width and breadth of the land. Just like the floodwaters come up to the neck, Assyria will destroy the complete width and breadth of Ephraim, northern Israel. The phrase stretching out of its wings, this phrase could refer to the outward spread of the flood waters by its more, but it is more vividly seen as a change of metaphor. 
The Assyrian, like a huge bird of prey, overshadows the whole land, ready to pounce. 18 verse 9 the phrase associate yourselves refers to Isaiah now tries, addresses the invading armies and the far countries of the world. He warns them that if they form alliances, they eventually will be broken in pieces. The phrase gird yourself broken in pieces, meaning although the inhabitants of the world attempt to protect, gird themselves with temporal weapons, they will be destroyed or broken in pieces. The twice repeated phrase is probably the result of a scribal error. The re repetition is not found in the Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 18 verse 10, take counsel together, meant... Despite the attempt of the world's inhabitants to make war plans and prepare for temporal salvation, their plans will be worthless, come to naught. Their careful design, defense, shall not stand. Phrase, God is with us, meaning at the point when Assyria overran Judah, all seemed to be lost. But Emmanuel, or God is with us, prevented the destruction of Jerusalem. Isaiah 37, 33-36 describes this miraculous event where not, where not even an arrow flew over the walls, referring to the walls of Jerusalem. 18 verse 11, with a strong hand, this expression means with power. This phrase is a code used to describe the basic experience of a prophet who is receiving a message. Apparently, Isaiah is using a formula which had long since come into general use. Walk in the way of this people, meaning to travel in the paths of the wicked. 18 verse 12, conspiracy. The conspiracy may refer to the enemies of Judah who had hoped to install a puppet ruler, the son of Tabil, on the throne of Ahaz. The phrase, neither fear ye, their fear, means this refers to the fear of the damned who carry the burden of their sins and who succumb to the world's unrighteousness and unproductive, unproductive influence. The righteous reverence and fear the Lord and thus find peace. 18 verse 13, the phrase sanctify the Lord. The little translation from the word from the Hebrew reads, make him a temple, the Lord of hosts, meaning let the Lord be your temple, your place of holiness. The same idea is contained in the phrase shall be for a sanctuary. Peter and Nephi use similar language, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts is from Peter and they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, which is in Second Nephi. Let him be your fear slash dread meant. The Israelites should not fear the Assyrian Empire's temporal might and power. Instead, they should place their attention and fear on the Lord, who possesses everlasting might. To fear the Lord is to honor, revere, trust, and obey him. Chapter 18, verse 14, Sanctuary. Other inspired writers have identified the Lord as a sanctuary or temple. In addition, Jesus Christ is both the temple's chief cornerstone and its sure foundation. The veil of the temple represents Christ's flesh. Stone slash rock. These are two synonymous symbols for the Lord. To the righteous, Jesus Christ is the elect and the precious chief cornerstone of the temple on which they might build and have a safe foundation. But unto them which stumble at the word, Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The phrase, both the house of Israel, means these are the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Jinn refers to a trap or a snare. Jehovah lays a snare for the wicked whose values are distorted. He catches them in their sins and eventually he will cast them still entrapped into hell. Elder Bruce Ron McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles noted the ability of Emmanuel to both save and condemn, quote, When the stone of Israel comes, he shall be a sanctuary for the righteous. They say they shall find peace and safety under the shelter of his gospel. But he shall be a stone of stumbling or a rock of offense 
as also a gin and a snare to the rebellious and disobedient in Jerusalem and in all Israel. They shall stumble and fall because of him. They shall take offense because of his teachings and be condemned and broken and snared and taken for rejecting them. End of quote. Eight chapter, I'm sorry, these should all be chapters 18. After 18, verse 15, stumble, fall, be snared. Many individuals will stumble over the rock of offense, Jesus, and fall to the ground. Like an animal, they will be ensnared and taken captive by the devil. 18, verse 16. Isaiah is first instructed to bind the testimony and seal the law. These actions fit into a divine sequence. The saints must first receive their endowments and then war warn the world's inhabitants of God's coming judgments, which will be followed by the binding up of the testimony and the sealing of the law. Finally, the judgments of God will come. It's 18 verse 17, I will wait upon the Lord. Robert D. Hells, the Quorum of the Twelve, spoke of the spiritual strength that follows when we place our trust in the Lord. Quote, As we put our faith and trust in the Lord, we must battle our pain day by day and sometimes hour by hour, even moment by moment. But in the end, we understand that marvelous counsel given to the prophet Joseph Smith as he struggled with his pain of feeling forgotten and isolated in Liberty Jail. My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversary and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. My dear brothers and sisters, when pain, tests, and trials come in life, draw near to the Savior. Wait upon the Lord. Look for him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Healing comes in the Lord's time and the Lord's way. Be patient. End of quote. 18 verse 18, chapter 18 verse 18, and I and the children are for signs, meaning Isaiah and his family are living symbols unto the house of Israel. Their names are also prophetic and serve to instruct the house of Israel according to God's plan, as we have discussed. 18 verse 19, Israel does not follow the prophetic word. Instead, she seeks the word of God through wizards and familiar spirits. The Familiar spirit slash widgers means these two expressions often used together refer to those who seek truth through false means or wish to learn about the future by communicating with spirits. Such will be cut off. The words peep and mutter, meaning peeping or whispering and muttering, are methods the familiar spirits and wizards use to, to claim they could communicate with spirits. The phrase, should not a people seek unto God for the living to, uh, to hear from the dead? I mean, Isaiah instructs us that we should seek the truth from God and not from wizards or familiar spirits who claim they can speak to the get dead. God's living prophets can speak to us who have heard and received revelation from the dead or from the world, spirit world. 18 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, meaning Isaiah appears to be swearing a sacred oath by the testimony of God's law and the prophets. The phrase, no light in them, meaning the spirit of the Lord was withdrawn from Israel because her people sought revelation from familiar spirits and wizards and rejected the testimonies of the prophets, the consequences of rejecting prophets. 18 verse 21, Israel wanders lost and alone in the telest world because of her sins, which have separated her from God. The phrase roam through the land, meaning here Israel is in her scattered and forsaken condition, lost and without a home. The phrase hard pressed and hungry means this may be a literal reference to those who need food and sustenance. It may also symbolize those in exile who suffer because the word of God has been removed. Those who are driven from their homeland 
are hungry for the Lord's word and will, will look upward and earthward for revelation and for, for the prophetic word, but they will not find it, all because they refuse the Lord. 18 verse 22, the Lord will be, the, the world will be walking in darkness, apostasy, in the shadow of death when a great light like Jesus Christ will make an appearance. Darkness may refer to an actual place on the earth where the gospel is not found, or more likely it may refer to a people who have chosen darkness, evil, rather than light, righteousness, and truth. Let's now finish up with 2 Nephi 19 compared to Isaiah 9. 19, 1 through 2. As the Assyrians swept down against the alliance of Israel, Ephraim, and Syria and the Syrians, they destroyed Damascus and capital and captured the northern region of Israel, later called Galilee. The text in 2 Nephi 19.1 refers to this occurrence as a vexation that brought dimness. In spite of this invasion and the threat it posed for the rest of Israel and for Judah, Judah in the south, Isaiah prophesied of the coming of the Messiah to this region as the coming of a great light. The lands inherited by the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali were in northern Israel, or Galilee, where Jesus was raised and spent most of his ministry. Matthew and John saw the fact that the Messiah dwelt in the area of Galilee as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. 19 verse 2, the phrase walk in darkness, dwell in the land of the shadow of death, means the land of the shadow of death is a land peopled by those who do not know Jesus Christ, the greater light, and his gospel. Therefore, they walk in darkness. 19 verse 3, multiplied the nations, meaning... This is in connection to the Abrahamic covenant, wherein Abraham was promised a great multiplication of his posterity. The word joy. How has the joy increased? The answer is found in a threefold repetition of the word for in 19 verses 4 through 6. First, there is an increase of joy because the Messiah has broken the rod of the oppressor, 19.4. Second, because the soldiers, boots, garments, and other items of war will be burned with fire, symbolically and prophetically, the boots and garments identified in 19.5 refer to all unclean and corrupt things that will be burned with fire at Jesus Christ's glorious second coming. Specifically, the weapons of chari and chariots of the nations, armies, boots of the soldiers, will burn when the Messiah comes to rule. And third, because a child is born who will establish his righteousness and government and establish peace among nations. The phrase harvest, divide the spoil, God's victory over Israel's enemies will bring Israel, a joy similar to that experienced by the farmer at the time of harvest, when he has an abundant yield, or to victors of war who receive spoils and booty. 19 verses 4 through 7 presents a messianic prophecy that is directly connected to the coronation and enthronement of Jesus Christ, when Jesus is made king of kings. Kingship theme in this section include the victory of Jesus as the new king over oppressive kingdoms. 19 verses 4 through 5. The new kingdom receives the government. 19 6. The king receives names fitting for the kingship in the naming ceremony. 19 6. The king becomes God, father of God, and member of the royal family, prince of peace. 19 6. The king is given the throne and the kingdom. 19 7. And the king rules over forever with judgment, peace, and justice, 197. The prophetic setting and context of 19 verse 7, 4 through 7 primarily point to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, although, although sub themes have appropriate application in other sentences. For instance, 19 verse 6 refers to both Jesus' mortal birth and his millennial reign. Because Jesus Christ has become king, the nation's burdens have been lifted and their oppressors removed. 19.4. And there is no need for soldiers and other associations with war. 19.5. The Prince of Peace, 19.6, now reigns. 
The four royal names were titles given to Christ at the time of his investiture of authority and kingship, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace, emphasized Jesus' ability to judge in righteousness, his godhood, his fatherhood, and his royal nature. The four names also recall the four parts inherited in the name of Isaiah's son, Mahar Shaal Hashpahaz. The name Maher Sha'al Hashpaz speaks of the judgments of God on Israel. The four names of Christ in 196 refer to the ultimate victory of the house of Israel because Jesus the Messiah has become the King and God. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland wrote of the fulfillment of Isaiah prophecy, 2nd Nehemiah 5, 196 through 7, being related to both the atonement and the time of the millennium. Quote, the fact that the government would eventually be upon his, Christ's shoulders, affirms that all the world will one day acknowledge that he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and will one day rule over the earth and his church in person, with all the majesty and sacred vestments belonging to a holy sovereign and a high priest. All can take comfort from the fact that because the government and the burdens thereof will be upon his shoulders, they will be lifted up in great measure from our own. Yet this this is yet another reference in Isaiah to the atonement, the bearing away of our sins, or at very least in the reference of our temporal burdens on the shoulders of Christ. End of quote. Elder Jeffrey Hall, Holland also helps us to see the importance of the various titles applied to the Lord Jesus Christ, quote, as wonderful counselor, he will be our mediator, our intercessor, defending our case in the courts of heaven. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. Isaiah and Nephi reminded earlier in 2 Nephi 13, 13. Note the wonderful comparison of our counselor and spokesman in this passage of Latter-day Scripture. Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, and him thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. Of course, as noted by Isaiah, Christ is not only a mediator, but also a judge. It is in that role of judge that we may find even greater meaning in Abinadi's repeated expression that God himself will come down to redeem his people. It is as, as, it is as if the judge in that great courtroom of heaven, unwilling to ask anyone but himself to bear the burdens of the guilty people standing in the dock, taking off his judicial robes and comes down to earth to bear their stripes personally. Christ as merciful judge is as beautiful and wonderful a concept as that of Christ as counselor, counselor, mediator, and advocate. Mighty God conveys something of the power of God, his strength, omnipotence, and unconquerable influence. Isaiah sees him as always being able to overcome the effects of sin and transgression in his people and to triumph forever over the would-be oppressors of the children of Israel. Everlasting Father underscores a fundamental doctrine that Christ is Father, creator of worlds without number, the Father of restored physical life through the resurrection, the Father of eternal life for his spiritually begotten sons and daughters, and one acting for the Father Elohim through divine investiture of authority. All should seek to be born of him and become his sons and his daughters. Lastly, with the phrase Prince of Peace, we rejoice that when the King shall come, there will be no more war in the human heart or among the nations of the world. That is, a peaceful King, the King of Salem, the city that would later become Jerusalem. Christ will bring peace to those who accept him in mortality in what era they live, and he will bring peace to all, peace to all those in his millennial and post-millennial reigns, realms of glory. End of Elder Holland's quote. 19 verse 7, 
of the increase, meaning Christ's kingdoms and peace will increase throughout the eternities. The phrase throne of David, meaning the throne is a metaphor for kingship, dominion, and sovereignty. Jehovah is crowned, seated on the throne of David, and rules with great glory and justice for eternity. The phrase to order it, meaning Christ's society replaces the confusion of the telestial world. Judgment, justice, meaning the Messiah will rule his kingdom with perfect justice. The phrase zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this means this expression is also found in 2 Kings 19.31. It is an assurance that the promise will in fact be faithful because the Lord will support it with zeal, with all his strength. 19 verse 8, Jacob slash Israel. In this section, God's word is directed to Ephraim or the northern kingdom of Israel. It also has application to the covenant people of our day. 19 verse 9, all the people shall know, meaning all will know that the word of the Lord has been delivered to Ephraim. Ephraim slash Samaria refers to Isaiah uses the term Ephraim here to refer to Israel's northern kingdom. Samaria was the capital city of that kingdom. The phrase haughtiness of heart means a symbol of pride in contrast to those whose hearts, whose hearty hearts are those, in contrast to those with haughty hearts are those who possess a broken heart and a contrite spirit. 1910, the revised version of the scripture says, and her pillars shall not, shall be broken in pieces, and all they that work for hire shall be, shall be grieved in soul. Pillars, that is, the foundations of society or principal men, shall be cut down. 1911 through 12, the adversaries of Resine, which is the king of Syria, were the, were the Assyrians. Syrians slash Philistines, as history took its course, Israel had to suffer immensely at the hands of both the Syrians in the east and the Philistines in the west. The phrase devour Israel with her open mouth means devour and open mouth are symbolic of the attack of a lion. The prophets often compared warring nations to lions that mangle and destroy. Bl the phrase, his hand is stretched out still, means while the phrase, his hand is stretched out still, is most often an expression of righteous anger, it is elsewhere portrayed as a hand of mercy. For behold, I speak unto you with sharpness and with power, for my arm is over all the earth. For I am God, and mine arm is not shortened. I will show miracles, signs, and wonders unto all those who believe on my name. 19 verse 13, the phrase, people turneth not unto him that smite them, means to turn is to repent. Even though God's judgments come upon Israel, her people still refuse to turn to the Lord who chastens them. The phrase, neither do they seek the Lord, meaning in the words of a modern revelation, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world. Oh, how that applies today. What greater calamity can come than we walk after our own way instead of walking after God's ways? 19 verses 14 through 15, the phrase, therefore will the Lord, meaning the Lord indicates once again that God is in charge of the world's affairs, including, including those of his elect people. The word head and tail means we learn in 1915, chapter 19 verse 15, that the head represents the elders and the old men of the community and tail symbolizes false prophets. Branch and bulrush stem means the branch is a palm branch located high up on the tree, representing society's leaders. Bulrush stem located near the ground represents the common people. The phrase in one day means, this phrase means quickly. 19 verse 16, the phrase leaders cause them to err, means since the leaders cause the people to stay from the truth, and justice, and since the people choose to follow, both will be destroyed. 
Chapter 19, verse 17, the phrase, young men, fatherless, widows. In the book of Isaiah, it is clear that the Lord champions the cause of the widow and the fatherless. In this particular judgment against the northern kingdom, however, the widows and fatherless are as guilty as their leaders and false prophets. For the Lord does not have joy nor mercy even for those who are socially rejected or have temporal needs. Every one of them is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speak folly. That's 19 verse 17. Certainly the entire nation has been rejected. The phrase mouth speak folly means the New International Version uh, translates and puts it this way, every mouth speaks vileness. President Brigham Young commented on those hypocrites who try mingling God and the world, quote, cease to mingle with the wicked. Many of our elders seem to believe that Christ and Baal can be made friends. How many times elders of Israel try to make me worship, I mean fellowship, the devil or his imps or his servants also try to make you fellowship your enemies to amalgamate the mag. Uh, amalgamate the feelings of the saints and the ungodly. It cannot be done. It never was done and never can be accomplished. Christ and Baal, that was the false god during the time of ancient Israel, never can be friends. One or the other must reign triumphantly on the earth. And I say that Jesus Christ shall reign, and I will help him. And Baal shall not reign here much longer. And the devil shall not have power much longer upon the land of Joseph. Can error live? No, it is the very plant of destruction. It destroys life. It withers. It fades. It falls and decays and returns to its native element. Every untruth, all error, everything that is ungodly, un unholy, ungodly, will in its time perish. You have no need to fear, but fear to offend God. Who are the evil doers? Those who have had the light presented to them and rejected it. End of President Brigham Young's quote. 19 verses 18 through 19, the phrase fuel of fire. Meaning in 2 Nephi 19.5, the bloody battle gear is fuel for fire in the preparation for the joy and peace of the greater light. Verse 2. In contrast, the fuel for fire in verses 18 and 19 is wickedness, including the people who continue in darkness to the point of not sparing even their own brother. Isaiah describes the wicked as undesirable plants, such as briars, thorns, and thickets. He also says the judgments for wickedness are like a fire that devours the, the briars, thorns, and thickets. In other words, the wicked shall be like the fuel of fire, and the smoke will be so thick that the skies will be darkened. The burning of the wicked here is a type and shadow of the burning that will occur at the second coming. 19 verse 20, he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry, meaning during these times of trouble and destruction there will be a great shortage of food so that people will scavenge here and there but will not find enough to satisfy their hunger. We'll probably see that repeated in the last days. Chapter 19 verse 21, Manasseh slash Ephraim. The Jerusalem Bible reads, Manasseh devours Ephraim, Ephraim devours Manasseh, meaning that tribes, families, and even brothers will contend against one another during these times of trouble. Earlier, is, Isaiah says that no man shall spare his brother, 19, verse 19, and they shall eat every man the, the flesh of his own arm, 19, verse 20. The phrase, they together shall be against Judah. Manasseh and Ephraim will strive against one another as to all is against Judah. Thank you for watching. Hopefully that helps you with some of the phrasing and wording of Isaiah. Notice how that all of it applies to us in the latter days. The wickedness, the judgments that are coming, the destruction, and the joy of the righteousness can all be had if we will just follow the Savior. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.